and um, I'm the person who wants to add an Could you speak up a bit, please? <coughs> sure. I'm the person who wants to add an, a two-car attached garage to the existing dwelling. Um, it has come to my attention that the need for the special permit is because the setback for an attached garage is 20 feet and doesn't meet the 20 feet setback at this point in time. So I'm looking for an override for that perspective. I did hear that uh, the DPW weighed in and said that uh, there was a comment made that there's an existing driveway and the plan includes a different driveway. And they said that uh, there's only one driveway, um, I forget the term, curb cut. Curb cut, uh, there's uh, only one curb cut is allowed. So the question was whether I'm gonna remove the old curb cut and the answer is yes, I'm not gonna use that as a driveway. The only other comment that was uh, directed, it was that um, the curb cut maximum was supposed to be 15 feet and, and the plan is drawn up by the architect. It appeared to be about 20 feet. I have no problem with making the curb cut 15 feet rather than uh, the perhaps 20 feet. Okay. And, uh, were you going to remove the old one car garage that's in back or leave that as a shed or something? I was gonna repurpose that building into some other purpose but I was not gonna remove it. I wasn't going to use it as a garage. Uh -huh. Probably like a tool shed. Yeah. Any questions from the board? I think the standard we're applying, even though the ordinance is, even though this isn't a finding, the standard is similar whether the right. permitted relief would right. it's just be substantially more detrimental. Right. Um, and this is partly because it's a corner lot, so it's 20 feet on. It has two front setbacks, right. so um, that's why the additional um, setback is required, even though it's the side of the house. Um, mm -hmm. Wouldn't otherwise require that. Right. Right. The, the, the driveway would be on Northern Avenue, even though the address is on North Street. Right. Any other questions from board? Just one. Like, uh, I should have been looking at the planning, but how large will the setback be? Just not 20 feet, but how? I believe it's uh, I think it's like 14 feet. I believe. What is um? I thought I saw a reference to 12 feet by the building inspector. He wrote that down. I think it was an approximation. Right. Uh, one of the things that we didn't have is an exact property line there. I know that for the existing where the where the actual street is right now, where the pavement is, it's uh, when I by tape measure it's 22 feet. So clearly there's a, a part of the property that is owned by the town, and I don't know exactly where that is, but the building inspector, I think, did know approximately 12 feet. Right. But clearly to the road right now, it's 22 feet. Right. And I notice, and you'll, so you'll, you will also remove the asphalt that leads to the existing single car garage and reseed and plant yes. grass there, yes. and get rid of that curb cut. Yes. Um, I noticed there was a car this morning parked where your new parking space is going to be anyway. It looks like yes. it's already used for that purpose. Yes, I've been pulling it in just to park my grass. And, and there wasn't anything else, Carolyn, from DPW or communications from neighbor, about right. his neighbors? Okay. Right. Yeah, it didn't strike me as being... I'm, I'm here as an abutter Yeah, to well, we're going to... Oh, okay. We will, as I said, everyone will have a chance to okay. speak. Any other questions from the board? Uh, I just want to check um, that leaving the current unattached building makes no difference with respect to this as long as the um as long as they're still meeting the 45 40 percent minimum open space mm -hmm. so we would recheck that again i was under the impression that there was going to be demolition but we were just looking at those numbers so as long as these got at least as long as you have at least 40 percent open space on the site and you, there'll be some gained back by eliminating the driveway um, then they'll be fine it, and that is true that um, the only demolition was is a side porch that uh, will be removed. But uh, I know that when the architect drew up the plans, the um, with the existing uh, garage and the addition, it still is well with under the um, the allowed amount of building. Okay. Any other questions? Anything else from the board? Okay. I might not have been clear. What I meant was had. Carolyn's office received any correspondence from neighbors, but but 
we, we always let uh, anyone speak who wants to address the application. So is there anyone else who would like to address the application? Only yeah. me. Sure. I'd like to. Sure. Why don't you come up and if you could just give us your name and address, please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Paige Bridgens. I live at 12 Northern Avenue. I'm next door neighbors to Mark and Karen. Mm -hmm. And um, I just have questions about drainage. Um, drainage. Drainage. Yeah. Um, my concern is that with the removal of soil, as we know, soil holds water. Um, and replacing that with gravel, uh, my concern is that the next lowest place where water would go would be their basement and mine. And um, I want to make damn certain that this is addressed before the construction. As probably a lot of you know, the houses on the south side of Northern Avenue should never have been built. Uh, this was a stream bed and it got filled in and the water table is very high and um, there's flooding in most basements on the south side of Northern Avenue. So I'm concerned for both Mark and Karen's basement and mine and Betsy Dawn Williams' house, the abutter on the other side. And I just am wondering, I, I would like to know, I'd like to leave this meeting knowing what the drainage plan is. What is the plan for holding soil on the landscape or draining it elsewhere. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm sorry, yeah. Well, so the standard is that you, that you can't send water off site um, to any surrounding property. Um, obviously, since they're pulling up and reseeding the old driveway location, which is um, closer to the abutters' property than the proposed new driveway. There'll be additional soil there where there isn't any now. So it's sort of a, a swap. Um, this driveway will be a little bit bigger um, than the existing one, but... Um, but what about but the footprint of yes. the new garage, Thank which you. is a two-car garage, right? Well, the way, I mean, we have a maximum lot coverage right. for every lot in the parcel, and that's the standard. Um, so, you know, people, you, the only thing I can say is if there's a drainage problem on their own property, they'll have to figure out how to contain it and deal with it on their property, and they aren't allowed to send it off to other properties. So, you know, a good builder should know how to handle the roof runoff, um, the additional roof runoff. We also have, you know, the additional impervious cover is going to translate to potentially a bigger stormwater fee once we do get those bills going anyway because it's all based on the total impervious cover on your parcel. But that doesn't help the neighbor with her basement if it's flooding or if the flooding gets worse. Well, but then I would say that's the off-site drainage issue. I mean, you need to contain it on your site. You can't, if, if you're, if, if you do something on your property that it, that creates a, a situation that was never there before on somebody else's property, you're personally um, is there a presumption that, that if, if the water in the neighbor's basement becomes worse after this construction that it's, I mean, how do you establish that? that is there a, a presumption that if it becomes worse after this construction is finished, it must have been caused by this construction? How do you prove well, this in the real world right. if she finds that she has, I mean, one of the standard we're applying is should not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood, which generally means the neighborhood as a whole, by the way, not a specific neighbor. But I'm, I'm sensitive. Sure your, your question, that is, is it contemplated that the water in your basement, for example, would seep in from the ground? Or is are you worried about it running from Good question. this property onto yours? Good question. Um, on the south side of Northern Nav, there is a high water table, which is just, you know, um, water that is seeped in and comes up into the little pockets of our basements. Um, that I'm concerned about, um, especially as that could rise because it's not being held by soil particles. Um, and also the runoff. I mean, as it is, there are two garages. One of them is the old garage that Mark and Karen have and are intending to keep. And then the other is some other neighbors. 
that water pours right into my onto my property and and down into my basement so then you add more um, I mean even if it's pervious surface that's still going down to the groundwater the water table and um, and then the runoff from the roof um, I, I don't know how it can be held on site. How do you hold it on site? Well, is it now being held on site? That is the, is the, do you now suffer from runoff from his property? Well, yes, from both of these garages, I don't know about suffer, but they're, you know, I don't know how much, like what you were saying, Mr. Bloomberg, um, there's no way of ascertaining by, at my level of knowledge, anyway, how much of the rainwater that ends up in my basement is from these two abutting garages that are just a few feet away, um, you know, and how much of it would have just fallen directly from the sky? I don't, I don't really know, but I do. I'm counting on you to help me figure this out, so that I, I, now is the time to preempt flooding in my basement or theirs. I'm concerned about your basement too. And BD and Jeff's next door. And, and just, you know, these unintended consequences of, of an otherwise okay project, you know. Do, have you run into this before where you, or you, Carolyn, you know, where a project goes in and the abutter suddenly is dealing with more water than they had before? I think one problem that I have, I don't know about the rest of the board, is this, is that none of us have any expertise in what well, that is. If we're told that there is discernible water which is going you know, in some quantity from his property onto yours, then that's something that the building inspector can come and say to him, stop that. But on what might be coming into your basement because of a rise in the water table and how we could possibly know whether that would affect the water table, that is the construction of the garage, would affect the water table, is something that we just don't have any knowledge about. I mean, if you bring along an engineer who will come along and who will give us his expert opinion on all of that, then that's something that we could look at. But right now, we only have it's just speculation. So perhaps what could happen is that their project could bring in someone, or together we bring in someone who could address this issue and just ahead of time um, help us figure out if there would be untoward consequences of this project in terms of drainage. I am slightly downslope. My house is is uh, just slightly down slope and the flow, let me tell you, it goes that way. So, well, I was just gonna say, you know, the, the same amount of water is still gonna come out of the sky today as it does, you know, in six months when the garage is done. Um, there's sort of, so the water will find its way the way historically it's always found its way. I guess I, I would think the bigger issue is as long as the grading that happens during the project isn't directing water more than it does at present off-site is the issue. Um, the other piece of it is the garage and the driveway is moving further away from the abutting property, so you've got more potential absorption area between the properties now by removing the driveway, the by removing, well, no, by removing the old driveway and you're sliding it further mm -hmm. away because of the way that where the garage is going to be attached to the house. But again, as, as David Bloomberg mentioned earlier, you're, that's just taking into consideration the driveways. The footprint of the house I'm concerned about because there's going to be removal of soil and replacement of that with a, um, you know, gravel and um, slab. Right, but I'm suggesting there's more area for it to be contained on site um, because you are adding a pervious surface, but you're, you're still dealing with the same amount of water. Um, yeah, I think water site. should be directed away from, you know, into the, 
into the property itself rather than off the property. That's all you can do. I live on water still. Talk about a mess. <laughs> what, what, Some would, days, would the applicant, and I, have, I may get jumped on saying this is way out of line, but, but I'm just thinking out loud. Would the applicant consider also removing the existing one car garage and reseeding so that so that that's replacing some permeable surface and I'm not saying you have to do that I'm just asking if that's something you consider towards us towards as a way of addressing this concern it's not in I'd, I'd rather not um, deal with removing that building I'd rather reuse it I would like to comment, and, and I appreciate what Paige is talking about, but at the same time, I believe that if I was, if this addition were exactly the same footprint, exactly everything was the same, the difference is it was living space as opposed to a garage, and I believe that it would not have even come to this board, I think a building permit would have been issued. The fact that I'm not putting a basement underneath there, I think to your point is that there's also soil underneath this lab that is they can absorb stuff. If I was putting a basement, it's also removing some additional um, soil, but there's, it's a slab, and as water gets underneath the soil, it can dissipate also horizontally underneath the slab of cement. So right. I think that, um, again, if, if, if our building living space as opposed to a garage, then all the setbacks and everything would have been done. So it's just the fact that it's a garage. Right, I appreciate that. But the standard we have to apply is, will the change for this permit is, will the change be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood? And again, that typically doesn't mean to one neighbor. It means neighborhood. And usually that's an aesthetic issue. In this case, I personally don't see any issue with the relative proximity of the houses in that neighborhood. From an aesthetic standpoint, I don't see any issue in terms of substantially more detrimental, but what's changed for me is hearing that there's a history of, of a water problem in the basements, and I just want, I, I want to be thoughtful about that. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I guess to follow up on what the um, applicant has said, the, the, the permit that's in front of you is because it's a garage space closer to the front setback than would require and they've already got some non-conforming setback, so that's what's triggered it. And if it were meeting those setbacks, they could do the same footprint if it was just stepped back a little bit further without coming. So the, the, the review is, is that garage <coughs> space closer to the street substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than if it were either complying or um, it, is it more substantially more detrimental than the existing non-conforming garage setback that's there. Um, so I, I think I would sort of direct in that uh, way as well. Um, and I believe this is a two-story addition, so it does have living space above, um, but it's really about the garage space. If I can also mention that I would also consider, if you wanted, for the runoff of the roof, I could put the gutters, uh, the spill off from the gutters, into a dry well. Um, you might have to, depending upon how much ground. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's an appropriate condition. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm, I'm, and I agree with you, Barry. We're the, I'm struggling with the fact that this board doesn't have this kind of expertise. What? We're being asked to, to be, to provide a a safety net against this anticipated problem, but at the same time, we, we don't have the technical expertise, which isn't very helpful, but it's a fact. Um, but and a I'm dry well sure sounds also, helpful. If, given the way that Carolyn just laid out our consideration, our issue, I'm not sure we even have jurisdiction in, in, in the way this is. So it sort of becomes I'm an. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. But you know, if, if the if the consideration is the setback, you know, the garage as opposed to really any other considerations, that's one thing. You know, and the water. Well, they're, they're not going to be able to divert water from their property onto other properties. They've got to get a building permit. They've got to 
go through the whole process. They've got to get an inspections and the final inspections. Right, but in the, that's in theory. In the real world, I know how I would feel if I were the next door neighbor and my basement started filling up more, you know, substantially more than before. But, and then, but I think the point is that it becomes an enforcement issue. Then it would, then the recourse for the neighbor would be to go to the city and say, you know, this this is clearly there's clearly runoff coming from from the corner property because I this problem has gotten worse than it was before this garage was built. Can we clear this up for a second? Yeah. I mean, if that were the case, if that were to happen. Then what is the recourse? Is there like a digging and a drainage that would then have to be done? Well, it does get complicated, but I guess if I could circle back a little bit to the extent that the existing garage is also shedding water off site, um, and that's a problem. I mean, you could say that ensuring that the new garage doesn't do the same thing by requiring a dry well, you sort of tie those things together in terms of permit, and I think that would be an appropriate, um, appropriate solution that the dry well obviously have to be designed based on the soils that are there and hopefully the soils will you know that there'll be a mechanism to, to contain that and, and let it slowly release so I think there is a nexus you could create with it with an um, existing non-conforming setback on the garage um, but that. it would be to come back after the fact there would be a there would have to be a lot of <laughs> analysis on both sides well, how much water and have we had in a, a huge a rainfall summer or fall or winter or whatever and is everybody you know um, subject to the same problems and it's not just because of this house it's because to come back to my first my question you know if as, assuming that there is a problem later on um, you know is there is there a solution that would be imposed through enforcement at that point that could be done now instead you know to, to preempt that problem but that's where we're we speculating. We that. are. I mean, look, there are two problems, sort of potential problems that have been spoken of. The one that is of surface runoff from one property onto another, everybody has agreed that that can be handled. That would be something that the building inspector would do at the time of the building of the garage. As for raising the water table so as to uh, uh, infect uh, adjacent properties. I mean, with respect, that just seems to me to be absolutely rank speculation. And furthermore, I have a feeling, too, that the applicant has, in good faith, submitted all of these materials, has made a, a thing, and I think that he deserves a decision tonight. I agree. Uh, I, I, I don't think that you're going to want to hire an engineer who's going to be able to speculate further upon this as to whether building that is going to raise the water table. Why and not? Why wouldn't I? Well, because for one thing, I think it costs you thousands of dollars. Um, so could the, uh, you know, the removal of flood water from my basement, I mean, I'm just, I, I'm, I, I'd like to. If it's surface water <coughs> moving over, then that's something that's clearly something that he cannot do. As for raising the water table, I have no idea how anyone would go about proving that. Um, I mean, it, you got to hire and a yet you feel, and, and yet you feel, as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals, you feel like you want to decide on that tonight? Well, rather you know, than... You did get notice of this in some time. You could have come in and said, well, I've hired this engineer and he's going to, would you please hold off on the decision for a while? I but thought I would come here first and, and, and talk with you about it. That's, well, that's where I am in my process. Yeah. Right. But and I would well, appreciate your help on that. But the dry well, again, to me as a layman, sounds yeah. like a helpful yeah. modification. I mean, that's what that's for, right? Mm -hmm. It's to capture and secure on-site and I imagine it's some additional, perhaps substantial expense. I don't know what the expense is, but I'm sensitive to that point as well. So the dry well is a column of gravel, is this correct? And the water goes down to the, the water table. To the water table. 
That's what I thought. It, it, yeah. it will allow on-site percolation uh, as existing conditions. The, t the water table is not going to rise based on structures you put on the surface. Sure. The water right. table is the water table. Right. So what we're talking about is a potential impact for surface runoff to go right. off onto the property. And so to the extent you're containing it on site and letting it percolate that's down, any property that's any property owner's going, yeah. right. only obligation right. is to retain surface water so it can dissipate on his own site and not onto the neighbor's property. As it does that currently. is probably the best we can do. Right. And what I think I'm hearing is that the dry well is is a proven time-tested way to do it. Right, so long as the soil conditions support that. So we would look at that as right. So would would there be I don't have much experience with dry wells and the ones I do have experience with are kind of primitive. Um, would there be one for each runoff surface or would they be coordinated to be a single dry well and where would that be located on the property? So long as the water stayed on the property I don't think it would make any difference to us or to the city where the dry well is located. Again, the obligation is to keep surface water from leaving his property. So long as the surface water is retained on the property, then he has fulfilled his obligation to the buttons. I, I guess I would just add that the, I would recommend that if you were to do a condition that requires a dry well, that it would capture the amount of water that's equal to what would be coming off the surface of the addition. So that it could be, depending on how it's designed, you, you know, if the roof area is 300 square feet, I'm just making up the number, then you have to capture that much of the volume. And it could be from the old part of the house, if it's easier from, you know, so you only do one dry, dry well, then it's just that volume as opposed to specifying where the dry well is located. And they make dry wells of those sizes, you, you know that? Yeah, it's all based um, on the conditions. If I, can just, if I can just add, is that um, to your point, Mr. Smith, is that if the real concern of the board is about um, surface runoff, to my knowledge, there's no surface runoff that's really going into Pages or other abutters' property. The addition, the roof is a shed roof. Um, the, the addition is going to be at least, I'd say, 20 to 25 feet from Pages' property. And the roof line is actually going to shed the water toward Norton Avenue and to the other butter, not necessarily in the direction of Pages. Uh, things. I don't know if there's, I don't believe there's a surface runoff water problem now. Um, and I don't believe that the addition would create one as either. Um, these are good points. Um, the the slope of the land is such that my house is lower than the properties, both your property and um, BD's next door to you. And um, so, you know, water flows, you know, down. No, no, I agree. We, we, can't, we can't change that. And we right. can't change the water. Right, table. but he was saying he didn't see how it I could. See. And you're and saying I'm just because responding, you're down. Saying because I'm down slope, it yeah. does. Yeah, but we it can't does change. Move that way. We can't watch it. All, all we can address is a, it seems to me is a condition to try in a in a in a practical and logical way to add a condition in the form of this dry well that would be designed with the language I think that Carolyn is suggesting or alluding to to ensure that any additional um, runoff created by the new construction is captured and retained on site with this dry well and those would have to be the the, or, the orders you know the directions or instructions for the engineer and or contractor who would be responsible for complying with the conditions of any permit that we might grant. I think that's, my gut feeling is that's the best we can do. 
Yes, I think we're also sort of going over much the same ground, raising yeah. the same ground. Yeah. So I would move that we close the public hearing. Okay, is there anyone else? Can I just add more sure. comment though, is that, because um, I, I really don't know how much the additional cost is going to be for the dry well. I offered that up because I think that is something that's reasonable. <coughs> so that I realized that it really is to capture the surface water, right? That's really what we're talking about. And again, the addition is going to be at least 20 feet, if not more, from Paige's property. And I think it's at least 10 to 15 feet or more to the other abundance property. So, you know, I guess I'm, I'm going to ask the board also to consider whether or not, I don't know how much extra it's going to cost for the dry well. And if you want to put that in there, that's okay. But I also would plead to you to say, if it, it's presuming that there's a surface water problem that is um, here, to, that is not proven right now. So, I will follow the instructions of the board. Well, one option, which I know you said you don't want to make it, make the applicant wait, is would would be to get some information about the cost of the dry well or other independent expert evidence that. It's not necessary for the reasons you've said, but on the other hand, you are increasing impermeable surface with this new structure that's substantially larger than your existing one-car garage and, and existing driveway with the new driveway and the new garage and living space. Um, but that's as far as I can go because I'm, I'm not a hydro engineer. Yes, sir. If I could be recognized, a, a drywall when you're putting a foundation in already is a very inexpensive proposition. Oh, okay. Okay. It's okay. simply it's a small excavation okay. with. And, and uh, your your name, please. Uh, Louis Hasbrook, the building commissioner. Oh yes, of course. So it, it's it's really not a okay. Very Great. complicated. Thing. I just didn't want to have a commitment of thousands and thousands right. of dollars worth. Louis, <laughs> would you be willing to speak to you? We're talking about not having enough expertise and. I don't know, maybe you would have experience with this of, of a project that removes soil then affecting a nearby property in terms of um, drainage. Um, we're, we did the, 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 the zoning and the building code deals 100% with surface water and a, a small dry well is a really common way of ensuring that surface water goes subsoil to different, you know, and, and no, the garage is not going to change the amount of rain that falls on that neighborhood, and so whatever gets into the ground gets into the ground. It doesn't change movement. Um, and it would be, an in theory, an enforcement issue if there were clear evidence that there was an increased runoff from the site to another to another site, um, because you're you just just said you're not allowed to do that. Right. So that would become an enforcement issue with the with the, through the city. So I think we do have a motion to close the public hearing. Thank um, you. I did. Okay. Sorry. I said. Okay. Thank you all for hearing our Absolutely. situation and trying Absolutely. to help us work through it. Okay. Thank you. So what we're going to do is by granting this motion, we close the public hearing, and then and then we would uh, immediately have a motion on the application. So it's it's. Uh, You're just yeah, so that a after we close the public hearing, we're, we're not allowed to have any more input. So I think we've received the input that was people wanted to give, right? Um, okay. Yes. Thank so, you uh, so much, you all. Sure. So we, we have, so we have um, a second and all in favor of closing the public hearing that's unanimous. And now a motion on the uh, application. Uh, who's doing the motion? I'll make the motion. Okay. I make a motion we approve the special permit application for the property. Um, I don't have the paper. It's uh, 194 North Street. 194 North Street, Northampton, uh, for an attached garage um, at 194 North Street, Northampton, map ID 25C 21. The property is, or the proposal is not significantly more detrimental. Um, I'd like to make a uh, <coughs> uh, okay. condition, condition that, we, <laughs> that uh, the uh, applicant 
construct a dry well to catch water from the um, roof of the new building and remove the driveway and curb cut to the existing one car garage. And narrow the new curb cut to 15 feet. And narrow the new curb cut to 15 feet. And before discussion, a second? A second. second. Discussion. We could say the applicant has to have the dry well to the extent needed, or do we not want to go there? Stick with just the dry well. To the extent needed to ensure compliance with the with the ordinance that does not permit any, or do you just, should we keep it simple? I, I think we keep it simple. Okay, so with well, the dry well. No, I, I like that idea. I mean, that leaves the burden <clears throat> on Mr. DePace to figure out whether or not he wants to get some expert opinion about whether or not the dry wall, the dry well is actually needed. Were he not to do that, then it would be needed. But it leaves him that option, and if it's there's a determination he doesn't need it, then he wouldn't have to do it. But that would, I think, just leave it in his court more than anything else. And I don't think that's not simple. But I guess my only other thought is that the neighbor has left the room and wasn't aware of this, but that, I guess it was her choice to leave the room. But, but um, I guess I think that since it's a violation of the zoning regulation to having water leave the applicant's property and go to his neighbors on, on either side, that your emendation is necessary. Is is not necessary. Just have it as as presented, as with, presented. with the requirement of the dry well. Yes, yeah, just with the requirement of the dry well. Yeah. Do you, are you okay in that voting? Are you how do you? Well, I just said what I said, so okay, I mean, you, I, you, you know, I think your... I don't think it's it's complicated right. to say, you know, if to say if necessary, which means that Mr. DePace would then get an expert opinion, which is none of us here right now, um, that would make that determination. And if it looks like a dry well would be necessary, he would put it in. And if it's determined it's not, he wouldn't, and then it'd be an enforcement. But, okay. I, but, I, but, you know, I, I mean, I, if, I you're, think, if you're willing I, to do it and go and, and well, with it, then... Yeah, I was going to say, given the fact that we've, we've been advised by an expert that it's not costly, and I'm going to add the fact that I feel like... I feel better about it because I know that then we will have really tried to address the concern of the neighbor, even though she's, she's left the room. Um, I, I think I agree with Barry. I think that we should just stick with the... Let me explain a little bit more is who makes the determination as to whether it's necessary. The applicant, Mr. Hasbro. Right. It, it opens up. It opens up a, com a complication. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. Okay. So, uh, do we have a, do we have a second? All in favor of the of the motion to approve the special permit with the conditions that were described. That's unanimous. Okay. So you are all set, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate your counsel. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. And yes, sir, sir, you're aware that there's a delay for an appeal period before. Uh, I'm not aware of the. Uh, oh, so what happens is the, the official decision of this board will be reported out, meaning delivered to the city clerk. Okay. Within, I imagine, a week or a few days, Carolyn, mm -hmm. the decision. That starts an appeal period clock for any of butters to appeal. And, uh, and then after that appeal period expires, which I believe is 20 days after the decision is delivered to the clerk. Uh, you would want to get from the city clerk a, uh, a, a, uh, a certified copy of the decision with her stamp that says no appeals have been filed. You then record that certified copy in the land records on King Street, all of records uh, next to the Calvin Theater, and then you would need that re evidence of recording typically to pull the building permit. And then they just reapply for the building permit? Uh, then I think you can get the building permit. You don't have to reapply. You just show that you recorded the the uh, special permit. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank Good you. Luck, Good luck. Sir. Yeah. Carolyn, do we? Yeah. Is there another board, just out of curiosity, coming in at a certain time? At 7. Yeah. At 7. Did you want to do no, a two-minute break? I just wanted to call at home. And I left my phone out in the car. That's okay, do you want to go back here? It's going to be, the person wants to do a projection, so it's going to take a couple minutes. Okay. Carolyn, four, four, eight. Carolyn said that she, has, she needs a couple minutes anyway. Five and six, sorry. Five, four, eight. Four, eight. Yeah. Okay, there you go. 
Yeah, we can figure, I think yeah. we can move on the record. On the record. We'll talk about it. We already have some documents that we've yeah. had the And that's what Carolyn was just saying. Ability to review. Right. Yes. I'm just, I'm just going to sit in three days as an arbitrator. Three full days uh, with, with the court reporter and swimming witnesses and rules of evidence. No, so that's what the screen is. Yes, it imagine. is. Carolyn, are we waiting for other people too? Or? No. Oh, this oh, is sorry. it. Okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna, you're still sitting up. I'm going to. Oh, yeah. Take a second. Okay. Bob? Uh, what? Did you want to do this? Again, it's your evening. Sure, I'll do it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, um, open the hearing. It's actually a continuation of a hearing on an appeal by CNS Sandler Acquisitions LLC regarding 236 South Street Map ID 38B-245. Um, understand this is an appeal of a decision of the building inspector, which I think requires. Carolyn, that requires a unanimous vote to right. overturn, right. correct? Mm -hmm. And and have, have we decided who's voting? Um, again? Oh, okay. um, so the three members vote, voting again will be Bob, myself, and Mary. Um, so when you're ready, just ask that you introduce yourself and name an address for the record. And, Oh, we great. do have, and by the way, as, as was pointed out, we, we do have a pretty ample file already that we've looked over, so um, I'm not sure we need the, uh, I mean, it's within your discretion, but I'm not sure we need the, the full, uh, uh, excuse me. fully okay. detailed description, we, to the extent that we have materials already in our possession. And also, I should add that we lose this room in about 35 minutes. Um, why don't we see where we are at that point in time and how much more time we need and then and whether we need any technology before making a decision about moving to another room and continuing this evening or coming up with a different plan. Yeah. I think it's 
is what happened last time. Seven o'clock too. We're supposed to use the projector, and uh -oh. it's not looking good. No. We don't have the greatest tech. Could you equipment. say one thing? Yeah. Could you prevent the appellate from using scandalous language with respect to his neighbor, scandalous, unfounded language with respect to drug dealing and such thing? I think that's wholly out of place at a hearing such as this, and that he should not be allowed to do it. I agree. Okay, the well, use well. of the term um, swastika. I'm sorry, I can't get the screen. So if you mm -hmm. want to speak from your application, but that's okay. I mean, the it might pop on. You might want to leave it there. Just in case. Um, no, that's right. I can, I can work on it. I've got copies of the PowerPoint. Okay. So if it's a concern, yeah. we could also, I would offer another day to I don't want you to feel like you've been shortchanged because um, the technology isn't working. I think, it would, I think it would help to be able to see it this way, but I made copies of the PowerPoint as a backup, so I'll just, if it's okay, I'll give you copies of the PowerPoint, and then we'll just, we can go from the hard copy. Okay, and your, your name? Greg Sandler, uh, three, 3 Olive Street, oops, sorry, uh, 3 Olive Street, Northampton. Okay. Should he be instructed with respect to scandalous language? Yes, and you heard, you heard, did you heard, hear that admonition about, um, Go ahead. We do not want to hear unfounded, scandalous accusations about your neighbor. Fair enough. Okay. Is there something specific in the uh, in the um, documents that you're concerned about? Yes, with respect to your feeling that your family is threatened, sort of by uh, allegations of drug dealing. Um, the, this term swastika. So, yes, yeah. neo-Nazi sort of people there. We just don't want to hear any of that. Oh, um, well, I've actually got a photograph of the swastika. It's not a swastika. That Iron Cross is not a swastika. Um, In well, any it, case, the, the, yeah, issue, okay, the, the issue before so us, the yeah. issue before us, as I understand, and Carolyn, correct me if I'm wrong, is is well, first of all, the decision of the building inspector, but that relates to the legal question of whether the use of the property constitutes a home occupation or a business in a residential zone. Okay. Yes. And I think to the extent that that is the issue before us, that is the only thing, the only evidence we need to hear uh, is that evidence which relates directly to that issue, not extraneous facts or allegations that do not relate to that legal issue of whether the property is being used as a home certain imputations of criminal behavior. I understand. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I understand. Okay. With that uh, caveat. Uh, okay. All right. So, um, may I hand these out to you? Since sure. We're not going to... Sure. Okay, so um, again, Greg Sandler, I, uh, I own a property of 3 Olive Street in Northampton. Uh, and as, as you just rightly pointed out, the question here is regarding business use at 236 South Street. So the first uh, slide that you're looking at here uh, shows you uh, a view looking from Olive Street toward the garage at 236 South Street in question, where the red arrow is 
is where the pin for the property is. So you can see that the garage is about five feet from the pin. Uh, you can see the star on the left, which is where a gas line comes in. And then you can see five of the 12 or more motorcycles that were on the property at the time of the complaint. Uh, and the bike that you see there on the right was actually running, um, as is often the case when this photograph is taken. Next, uh, number two, um, just to give you some context, I've lived in, and owned property in Northampton for 25 years. I live four blocks away on South Street, 310 South Street. Uh, I've owned three Olive Street since 2001. Uh, between 1987 and 2010, total number of complaints that I've had for any reason regarding abutters, neighbors, at 310 South Street or 3 Olive Street is zero. Uh, no, page three. So again, just to give you um, uh, some, some context here, um, I've occupied 3 Olive Street since 2001, uh, and that's where my business is located. So the question again, as you rightly pointed out, is you know, what's the scope of the activity at 236 South Street, as we pointed out in the uh, appeal document, uh, ongoing restoration, repair, and sale of motorcycles, cars, trucks, and automotive engines. That's been going on since 2007. The history here, uh, I tried for several years to deal with both the tenant and the property owner at 236 South Street, uh, and um, was unsuccessful in getting any uh, reduction in the activity. In fact, the activity increased, as we'll take a look at here in a minute. Uh, so uh, the initial complaint that we filed was in 2010 uh, with the city. So this activity has been going on for, for quite some time. Uh, it's had an impact on, again, my business at 3 Olive Street. I have 10 to 12 people in the building at any given time. It's, <coughs> excuse me, affected our ability to conduct business. It's, conduct, it's affected our quality of life. Um, it's affected, I think, the property value at 3 Olive Street. And I think it also poses health and safety risks. Among them is I showed you the, the pin and I showed you where the gas line comes in. If there were a fire in that garage and it spread, my building would blow up, literally blow up. So the next slide here uh, is, again, the same view that um, I showed you before, looking from Olive Street. Now you can see my building. And the top of this is referenced. Yellow post is referenced uh, for the next slide. And uh, this is just to, to give you some reference for the, for the next slide. And that is headlined, uh, Ford truck delivered across three hour property line. This is what precipitated the uh, initial complaint um, back in, in 2010. And it's to give you some indication of the extent of the activity. Again, uh, on the very far edge, you probably can't see it so well in the picture on the right, number one, shows you the yellow post, that's where my building is. Number two shows you the, uh, where the shared right of way ends. And this guy who is delivering this truck is actually, as you can see, parked across the property line onto my property, delivering this truck, which as you're about to see in the next slide, was then the subject of uh, activity on the property for approximately um, uh, nine, 10 months. So this truck was delivered across my property line. The next page, which says Ford F5 for sale at 236 South Street, uh, shows you about eight or nine months later, that truck now posted for sale online. Um, and this is an actual screenshot of the vehicle um, posted for sale. So the truck was not drivable. It was brought in on a flatbed. It was fixed up in the driveway, mostly in the driveway. That truck wouldn't fit into to the garage bay, so it was mostly done in the right-of-way where it's parked. May I ask a question? Certainly, please. Yes. You have sort of a whole raft of complaints sort of up here, and many of these which, according to the building inspector, has been addressed by the city. What issues do you now have that were not addressed by, that have not been addressed. The fire, I take it like that, that's the fire department, they've made a sort of a report and sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's not before us. So what is it you're complaining about? Yeah, I, I think I think the, the appeal, and, and as, as we stated at the onset here, I think the real question here, is, there a, is this a business being run there, which was not addressed? That's number one. 
A subset of that is at the time of the complaint, uh, there were 15 plus vehicles, including 12 motorcycles housed on the property, and we have no idea who owns those vehicles or own those vehicles. So we don't even know what the activity was. The building inspector sort of said that he has taken steps to ensure that unregistered vehicles are removed from the premises. Uh, do you are there any are there vehicles there today? I didn't see any today. Uh, right now, there is there are three vehicles on the property. I don't know what's in the garages, um, but um, of, of vehicles on the property, um, I I don't know this for a fact because obviously I have no way to check it. There's a van that's been parked and undrivable for the better part of a year. It um, does have plates on it, but it is not registered. I mean, it's not inspected, so it's not drivable. If you stand, and I don't think you can see it in this picture. If you stand and look up the uh, shared driveway, there's a Ford pickup truck that has been sitting on the property now for almost two years. Again, um, doesn't get driven. I don't know what its status is. And there's a car parked in front of it that also doesn't move. And I don't know the status right now of those, those vehicles, but certainly this board or the building inspector um, by law could request that information. So, but we don't know that information today. Well, to begin with, the building inspector tells us in his letter that you can have eight parking spaces on that sort of with the tenant. And, he's met, and then again, if indeed there is a home business, uh, that a certain amount, a reasonable amount of things to be worked on would be reasonable. The fact that there is the same truck that's been on there for almost a year, did you say? I think would indicate, if anything, that it's not a commercial enterprise, but is rather a home business. I, I can't really address that. I mean, I, I'm just telling you what I can see on the property right now, as far as vehicles go. Uh, I don't know, again, what's in the garages, but at the time of the complaint, there were 15 vehicles on the property, and the question then and the question now is, is there a business being run? And if it's a home-based business, as you're suggesting, um, there is no permit for a home-based business there. And then I think the question is, is it a, permit, a permissible, is that home-based business allowed um, under the zoning regulations? And, and that's actually something I think that's part of the question. Well, provided that it's not a commercial enterprise, then it is allowed. Well, yeah, and, and again, that's a question I'm asking. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Sandler, um, is there anything um, on the premises that indicates it, that's advertising it as a business? Are there any signs or anything? There's no signage on the property that I'm aware of. Is, uh, is there anything that you're aware of to advertise it as a business? Uh, not, not the individual sales of vehicles that, you know, I, I've gone through right. your 103-page document. I've seen that, and this is largely um, you know, from that. But is there anything separate saying, you know, giving it a business name, advertising it as a business, or you know, what I've seen mostly are um, the ads, made, I don't know if they were a Craigslist or what they were, but there were, you know, individual ads for sale of particular vehicles. So is that, is that it or is there some, not me just is that it, but is there anything in addition to suggest that there's, you know, that this is a business, there's a business name or anything like that? I mean, I'm not aware of, of there's certainly, I haven't seen any signage and I'm not aware if there is. I mean, really the, the the evidence that there is business activity there is the constant flow of vehicles coming out, getting sold either online and or in the front yard of the property, and that's been going on for now eight years. No, I understand. I understand that, and you know, I, I, I think it's right. It's sort of a case by case determination after you look at the total um, amount of transactions that have been going on as to whether or not it rises to the level of it being a business. Um, and I guess the question here that Mr. Bloomberg just asked had, had to, having to do with, you know, the current level. I mean, we have a snapshot. It looks like a snapshot from April um, of what is, appears to be a fairly substantial amount of activity. The question is, you know, is there more than just that snapshot, you know, or, you know, what's happened in May, June, July, August, up until now? Um, and how regular and how, you know. So I, I think you can assume we've reviewed what you gave us. Um, I, I hope I'm speaking for my colleagues here. And 
Um, and I, you know, I saw your site to the Supreme Court case. I don't know what case it was. You didn't have a name there, but you know, I, I saw your site to the, the, the case that defines really what business is. So I guess the question is, in any kind of ongoing way, do you have anything in addition to this? Because you know, I know that there's been some overtime ads that you had in there. Um, you know, an ad here and an ad there. But you know, like, perhaps you can kind of move us beyond. Um, the April 2014 and some of these ads to talk about what else there's been on sort of the regular basis. Well, certainly, I, mean, I, I know since you've read the, the claim, I'm not going to go back and you know and, and review everything in the claim. But the, in the in in the actual, I'm sorry, in the, in the, the, the appeal document, um, we've detailed um, about you know eight different instances of over the last you know five years of vehicles for sale. Um, so where it's the same thing, the vehicles come in, they get fixed up, they get sold. In addition to that, we've had numerous instances, and this is one of the, the photographs that's, that's, if you go, the next photograph just shows the guy work, standing next to his van and, and the slides I gave you. In the slide after that, you can see another uh, motorcycle being delivered. This is two days before, I think, the uh, initial complaint was filed. Um, there's been regular activity where individuals who do not live on the premises, and this bike and the red pickup truck, the pickup truck is owned by the tenant, the bike is owned by the, the guy who's pictured in the next slide with the NRA t-shirt on. Mr. Sandler, yeah. can you help us then as to what you think the criteria for a home-based business are? I mean, is it your view, for example, that auto repair cannot possibly be a home-based business anyway? And if you say that automotive and motorcycle repair can be, then what is your standard? How are you to tell us on what is a reasonable amount of activity for that? I mean, I, I, I think that, and we, we, this is our, it's a good question, and we think we've articulated this in the, both in the appeal document that Bacon Wilson prepared and in, in the presentation I've given you here. Uh, my understanding is that um, Northampton zoning law clearly prohibits commercial business activity in this zone, and that you know any activity that entails restoration, repair, sale of motor vehicles and automotive engines is prohibited in this residential zone. And this is, I should point out, I don't believe that this qualifies as small engine repair. We're not talking about you know uh, fixing lawnmowers. We're talking about Harleys and pickup trucks and you know a lot of intense activity that's extremely loud. So if you right now listen to this room, this is the baseline in my office. Probably about 35 decibels. When this activity starts up five feet from my property line in my building, we've measured the decibel level at anywhere from 80 to 150 decibels, depending upon what activity is going on. And there's a constant stream of of third-party people coming to the property, leaving their, their motorcycles, and then coming back at some time. And you know, the, the, the times when the tenant has been asked about it, I have to say probably at least three or four times that I can remember, it's always another friend. It's like this long list of friends. He's like had dozens of friends, apparently, that have come to work on their motorcycles. They leave them there. He fixes them up, and then they drive off at some point later. Um, so this activity has been constant and regular, and, and I believe that we've articulated uh, in, and, and I think the case law is cited in the, in the, actual, do, the actual appeal document, um, that this is not uh, permissible use. Further, it has an, an adverse impact. It's not invisible, uh, as you can see. It has an adverse impact on the surrounding environment. Um, there's excessive noise across the property line. Uh, and just to, to quote one of the Northampton ordinances here, it says, there shall not be any business operation for vehicle repair for profit, any repair made to any motor vehicles except on a lot occupied by a permitted automotive use. So I guess what I'm saying here is, not only do you have a commercial use, I think it rises to that standard, but that, and that is the real question. Is this a, a commercial activity and to what extent is it a commercial activity? But even then, if you say, well, 
It doesn't rise to the level of a commercial activity, but then there's all these other zoning regulations that I think are intended to protect abutters like me in this zone from all of the overflow, the visual overflow. One of the slides you see in there shows a workbench and a bunch of parts that are stored behind the garage. Again, and you would know better than I would, but my understanding is with even as a home-based business, that's not permitted. You can't have all this debris. And we've had, when, when the building inspector came back in April, the property was just strewn with with debris, it was really but literally it, six years of accumulation. But it's not anymore, so that, that sounds like there was an enforcement issue that's been satisfied. Um, there was an enforcement issue, I think, in terms of after all of this time of, of asking for action, of taking care of what was the manifestation of the core issue. But there was no enforcement taken on the core issue, which is a business is being operated there's in a in a residential zone. So there's no doesn't have they haven't applied for a home based uh, business permit to my knowledge. I don't think they've ever done that. The other thing is that I that I want to point out is that the garage in question uh, was and you've got a, a copy of this here. There's five bays in the garage. Where this activity is taking place is in the first two bays. So if you're facing the garages, they're on the left and. You'll see the plot plan from, it's a copy, it's, it's probably midway through your stack there. You'll see some little red lines on it. Uh, some, sometime in the last seven or eight years, the building was modified, to my understanding, with no permit. So the wall between those two bays was modified to accommodate this use of the property. Not only that, there was a, an outbuilding behind it that was knocked down, and that's approximately right, well, it's, it's partly where you saw all the debris behind the building. So activity was taking place in the right of way, in the garage, and behind the building. Uh, and I, I think that was, you know, if the use of the building there, if the, if the standard use of the building, unless it was an accessory structure, is to store stuff, to um, you know, basically you know, put your cars at night or whatever, that's one thing. If it's been modified, to now make a, a big workshop, and you can see there's a picture of a Harley there, all the way through its stages. There's three slides, the Harley sitting outside the garage with no skin. Then you can see it up on a bench in the two-bay garage being worked on, and then you can see it uh, for sale on Craigslist and in the front yard for sale. So, yeah, I think it's, I think we've, we've demonstrated not only in the appeal document, but also I think in the PowerPoint that you've got here is that one, residential uses are, are, are allowed in the URB zone, but retail and automotive uses are prohibited. Two, as, as, as I think you rightly asked, home occupations, my understanding again, I'm not an expert, are allowed in the URP zone, but the use being made at the property at 236 South Street doesn't qualify as a home occupation. Three, the use isn't an accessory use to a lawful use, and it either requires a special permit or a finding. And four, the use is not an accessory use to a lawful use, as we've stated in the, in the, in the claim document, but it's in fact a principal use of that, of that building. It's rented separately, it's been altered to, to be able to accommodate this use, and it is, this use is happening five feet from my property line, a setback between the garage wall and the pin is five feet. Um, I, I want to come back to my question again. Just with, um, say in the last two months, what's been the activity there? So we're talking about, uh, say, August, September, October? Sure. Okay. Just, you know. um, August and September, fairly steady ongoing activity. Um, and I've what got photographs. Mean? I don't know what that means. Um, so, I'm going to daily dawn to dusk activity. In the last two weeks or so, um, it's actually been pretty quiet over there. It's been a dream inside our office. Actually, the last two weeks has been relatively quiet, although uh, over the last, you know, say, week, there's you know, been a motorcycle parked for sale out front where there typically is one, and there's been pretty much a, a vehicle out there for sale nonstop for, so for the last that, is that fairly regular kind of pattern to the extent that you can identify a pattern where there sometimes is activity and there's sometimes 
some respite from that and then back and forth? The, well, there's certainly over, over you know the last couple of years. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, typically, the way the activity cycles there is um, no pun intended. <laughs> Uh, is is it's pretty much daily dawn to dusk activity with some lulls from about March to November. And then when the weather gets really cold, uh, the activity tends to quiet down. There's some activity, sometimes the motorcycles. What do you mean by activity? What, what activity? Okay, so um, one is motorcycles being worked on. So the motorcycles will, will, will you know, be taken out of the garage. A lot of times they'll be sitting right on the right of way or sometimes even on my property and you know they'll be the throttles will be opened up uh, they'll you know they'll be um, I've got photographs which I think I've shared with the building inspector of test drives and you saw the the narrow shared right of way between the buildings so the tenant working on the bikes when he's working on them he'll sit out there and I've got tons of pictures of these if you want to see them so he'll open the throttle up Sometimes that'll last for 10 minutes. Sometimes that'll last on and off for hours as he tests and tinkers. And then he'll take test drives around the property. So he'll, he'll come down the, the shared right-of-way, go out onto Olive Street, and drive around. And sometimes that happens repeatedly as the bikes go around the buildings. Um, the other thing that happens frequently uh, is, again, as I said, there's a lot of activity with people coming in. So there's a steady stream and by steady stream I would say at least once a month during that window when the activity is the highest some third party or multiple third parties are coming and their bikes are getting worked on again in the driveway and we have photographs of that so I, I think the question is like they said I mean I think you are you're asking the right question number one is it a business activity I think I think the the Supreme Court and I thought the site was in the appeal document from Bacon Wilson, but I can find it for you. I, I, I was just um, quick I, I, the, the Supreme Court definition would also apply to a home by business too, right? Uh, yeah, presumably, yes. Continuity I mean, and regularity yes. of involvement in an activity and intent to make a profit. So yes, is that yes. I think either way, you're right. I think that that does. And so, like I said, I think if you if you say, well, the this doesn't meet, and I think we've proven that it does meet the minimum standard. I mean, I think, again, I think that my read and, uh, you know, the, Mark's read who, who helped prepare the, the appeal was that, as we detailed here, that, you know, that there's a whole bunch of different regulations here that try and protect abutters from exactly this kind of activity. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't rise to that standard, you don't, no one's come before this board and asked for a, a special permit, so so you don't really you don't have a, a bona fide home-based business where somebody had to come here and say, look, I want to fix motorcycles, cars, trucks, engines, and pickup trucks at this property. At which point you could make a determination and you could say, you know, it is or isn't uh, okay at, under uh, Northampton law. Uh, but that hasn't happened. And if there's a determination that it's not a home business, what other arguments do you have to make about the conditions that you want to make? Uh, that's also, I think that's also a great question. There, I think, I think, and again, you know the, you know the zoning um, regulations way better than I do, but 350.12.1 and 312.26, that's adverse impact on the surrounding environment and excess noise from, from the activity, um, are at least two areas in which this activity uh, again, seems to um, way tip the balance between this and, I mean, I'm not going to, it would be melodramatic to play a Harley, but if you could imagine a Harley just outside that door, at any time while I'm talking, firing up and sometimes going on for hours, and I've got a broadcast studio in that building. So, I, so every time that happens, it costs me thousands of dollars. It wipes us out, absolutely wipes us out. So I can't conduct my lawful activity in the building because it's constantly being disrupted by this other activity. Um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, I assume your commercial use is grandfathered in. Correct. Okay, secondly, um, uh, have any other neighbors, are you aware of any other neighbors or abutters who've complained about the noise or the activities there? 
or have we heard any? I, I'm, anyone else, Carol? Not that I know. Yeah, and I, uh, I realize you're you're especially close. You're right there. I get that, but I'm just asking out of curiosity because there's a neighbor facing 236 to the right. Yes, and, and that's there's the street yeah, to the left. Mr. Town, who's now 84 years old, um, if you stand in his front yard when he's watching TV, you can hear his television. So I, okay. I don't know that okay. I don't know that it's it's something that he's necessarily going to feel the adverse effect from. Um, and the next house um, down next to them, um, frankly, I mean, I've talked to them, and they basically said there's so much noise on South Street, it's just more noise. Yeah. Um, so so, so we are, we're, we're certainly the closest. One of the things I'm sort of struggling with a little bit, although I'm, I, I hear what you're saying, I think, I mean, I could, and, and I'd like to hear from the building inspector as well, but, but you could play devil's advocate and say, why isn't this a, 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 a motorcycle and car repair business? I mean, if, if there's that much traffic going through and that much advertising of, vehicles for sale and that many people coming and trying them I mean just for the sake of argument you could you could ask that question um, but but I am struggling with the fact that it, this also feels a little bit like um, uh, a fine line between almost like a common law nuisance sort of such claim or situation because of the noise and the disturbances and and so on, which of course recourse for that is is in the courts, not not here. Um, but I also see from the materials from the building inspector that every department from the city has been to the property in response to your complaints and and the feedback that came back specifically to the building inspector as a result is that yeah we saw this and this they're they're working on it yeah we saw this and this they're taking care of it no we didn't see anything that. You know that was a, a serious violation so it's not like a, a lot of resources have not been brought to bear by the city and and specifically by the building inspector to respond uh, as as thoroughly and professionally as 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 I think is possible by all parties involved to try to address the concerns and as a result of that entire process which I know for the building inspector has gone on for months and months as opposed to the minutes and minutes we've been here here listening to this um, uh, his you know reasoned uh, conclusion was that you know yeah there's a lot going on there but what's going on there is not a uh, uh, a business operation and there are distinctions there are no signs there there is no public advertising there is no um, I mean I mean you know what I mean broadcast advertising as opposed to individual vehicles for sale because a hobbyist could repair motorcycles and then put something on the internet and say, I now have this motorcycle for sale, and, and that's not necessarily a business. I mean, the reason we're here is this is a, a, diff, a, a complicated, nuanced situation. Well, and I think the question, I think, I think you're asking the right questions, and I think the question partly becomes, what's the standard? I mean, I don't know, again, I don't understand the regulations in Northampton as well as you do, which is partly why we turned to other, the Supreme Court to look for somebody that def is defining what a business is. Because I, I didn't see hobby defined anywhere in the Northampton code. Maybe it is, but I certainly didn't find it. Yeah, the, the other thing is, that I think the, the, the real question, as you just said, is, you know, is this a business? And I don't know that the, the standard for that is, uh, you, know, does, you know, does he advertise? Are there advertisements in a newspaper or online? I mean, I think, the fact that you've got dozens of instances of vehicles coming in, which we've documented in the PowerPoint and in the, in the, the appeal, getting fixed with everything that goes on with that fixing happening adjacent to us and impacting us, and then being sold, right? I mean, it, to me, that you know, that is, it's a business. But, you know, if it were a hobby, you know, I think you wouldn't be seeing this much activity. In the, in the um, document uh, from Bacon Wilson, we documented uh, 27 vehicles owned in the last, I believe it was um, seven or eight years by the tenant who's running this business here. We specifically asked that um, the building inspector, when he came again, find out you know, what the ownership was of all these vehicles on, on, on the property uh, and that information we don't have now, even though 
Massachusetts state law clearly allows this board or, a city, or any city official to request that information. So some of the information we just didn't get. To your point about the, 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 the cleanup activity, absolutely. After the building inspector came, again, the manifestation of what it was now six, seven years worth of ongoing activity, the crap everywhere, the, all the stuff that, I mean, there were literally truckloads of stuff carted out of there or moved from the garage into the van sitting on the property. This went on for three days. Stuff just that carted is, away. That isn't particularly evidence of a business activity there, is it? I mean, well, that isn't, if you leave sort of junk around on your property, it may be just because you don't want to clean it up. Except, except for that if you look at this from a standpoint of is it a business or is it a home-based business and is it permitted, it's not an invisible activity. The activity is still, not only is it spilling over visually, but we don't have the benefit of the, of the uh, uh, PowerPoint, but I've got two videos which I'd be happy to show you. One is that, is that uh, pickup truck we were looking at, which literally is parked on the right of way when we first start looking at it. Then the gears get ground. This is a YouTube video, by the way. The way that worked is he got the vehicle, fixed it up, and then posted online, and the same day that he posted online, he posted it for sale on YouTube, which is where that video came from. And you actually can see on this video, he pulls out from the right of way, pulls in front of my building, which is, again, common. So well, that's a trespass, isn't it? I, yeah. I understand, but what I'm saying is these are all manifestations of a business activity that, that I think in, in the city's wisdom, in a whole bunch of different ways, is, is not allowed. If it's a commercial activity, it's not allowed. Excuse me, I'm going to have to interrupt because I think we have to give up the room. Um, uh, what, what, what do we want to do? I could see um, what the status is up there. Yeah, and why don't you can continue on, and I'll I can just say, do you need to be in both places at the same time? Oh, do you have to attend planning for that? Yeah, they're doing a um, they're doing there's a presentation now initially, so um, I don't have to be there for that. It's just seven thirty. Um, I do I do have a question for you though, if you're yeah. before you leave, and that is, if if this isn't operating a business, and it is at best a home occupation, wouldn't the home occupation in this case require a special permit? Well, it really Which is depends. a question the, the appellant has raised. Yeah. So <clears throat> if, a, you know, we've, we've expanded the allowance of home, home business, right. but it does have to be invisible, you know, with sound and everything has to be in the garage. But as, so long as you're not exceeding 25 visits per week, um, and it's invisible. And it's invisible. Yes, you could continue like a small engine repair place. I mean, we're going to be able to over eight years. I don't think you're going to get 25 visits per week um, on the, in that. Um, but you know, at the same time, obviously, someone could do tinker with things like you said, a hobbyist and sell stuff on Craigslist or buy stuff from eBay or whatever. Um, so yeah. So, so I, have, I have one follow, quick follow-up question. Is, so, um, Carolyn, is this a, so is this a, do you then see this as a small engine repair operation? Is that what the interpretation I didn't, is? I didn't say that. I'm no, just I'm saying, asking. I, um, no, I, I don't, I'm not in the position to make that decision. And, and we do need to hear from the building inspector. Yeah, if, if, if you don't mind, um, Mr. Sina, I'd be really interested to hear from the building inspector. I mean, I, 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 I get, I get your argument, and I get the, I think you're right, the characterization of the nuisance piece. I guess um, I'd like to hear why the city, the building inspector, doesn't consider this a home business, and also why, um, whether the other ordinances that, has been, that, that you've cited or, or the attorney cited, in terms of uh, 350.12.1 and uh, uh, 12.188, and uh, well, I think the 358.9 answered, which is the home business. I think that's answered by by Carolyn's response. But why those may or may not apply in the situation, and um, what would need to be done to ensure compliance with those as well. Before you respond, Barry, did you have just yeah, I just have a suggestion. Yeah. yeah, 
I mean, it seems to me that uh, we're running out of our sort of room. I suggest that we, there doesn't seem to be any enormous sort of thing about this getting decided tonight. That if we put it off till the next time, we could hear from Mr. Hasbrook. Mr. Hasbrook, uh, too, uh, if, um, if this were uh, continued on, uh, like I think that if somebody made an attempt to, uh, to get in touch with Mr. Sandler, that that indeed might be helpful to your side of the, uh, of the, of the equation so that we could get more information from him as to exactly what he's doing there. Um, oh, not Mr. Sandler, you mean Mr. Chattel. Mr. Chattel. Chattel, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Excuse me, yeah, Mr. Chattel, yeah. Well, I think that's already been done. And I think if we have a half an hour, we might as well take advantage of it and see what we can get through now. And yeah, I think one thing's clear. If we lose Carolyn at 7.30, we will have to adjourn at 7.30. Right, but let's see what we can get. I agree, now. I agree. I let's let's keep at it while we can. Um, but do we all agree at 7.30, I think we're going to have to adjourn and continue this because I'm not comfortable given all the issues without having staff support. I agree. So, let, but, so I, is that work yeah. for people? Yeah. So yeah. until we get kicked out. So <coughs> you had a question, I think, for well, Mr. Sandler. No, my, my oh, suggestion Mr. is Hasper. to allow, to allow us to hear the from building Mr. Commissioner. Um, you'll have an opportunity to respond. But I think we understand and appreciate your issues. Um, and if we could hear why the building commissioner, um, you know, took the position that he took, that would, I think, be helpful for for us to hear that the, the other side. Yeah, if that's all right. Thank you. Yep. I'm Louis Hasbrook. I'm the building commissioner for the city of Um Go ahead. I'm not sure where to start. Um, I. I responded to a series of complaints, um, some I, that from Mr. Sandler about activities at 236 South Street, and I came to the conclusion that, um, that there's not a business being operated at 236 South Street. Um, that one of the, to me, one of the basic premises of a business is, that it is to make money, and Mr. Chattel doesn't make money there. He doesn't. I'm convinced by talking to a number of different individuals, people directly involved, and also people on the periphery of, uh, with knowledge of his activities, that he doesn't charge money for what he does. He's a lot of friends. He certainly is, a, is an, uh, uh, an avid motorcycle fan, but he's not working at 236 South Street to make his living. He makes his living other places. The motorcycle, he has two motorcycles that he wants to sell. One's a 1980, mid-80s uh, Kawasaki, and then he has an early 80s Harley. They're both classics. They're both, the Kawasaki is the same year and model that was used in that movie Top Gun, and it's got a certain um, cachet, and, uh, and then the Harley is just an old Harley. He, and he alternates those motorcycles um, that I'll, when I drive by, sometimes the Kawasaki's out there for sale, sometimes the Harley's out there for sale. They're both motorcycles that he restored. They're both his, um, and one or both of them is registered. Um, so I think that what I've come to with the, in this situation is hyperbole, and I've spent an awful lot of time trying to sort out the, the kernels of truth from the chaff. I mean, to think that just this evening, Mr. Sadler said that he's measured decibel levels in his business of 145 decibels. That's instant hearing loss. That's such hyperbole. It's, I think it's a physical impossibility. I think that somewhere's not very much farther than that, you die from sound. Your head explodes if I could engage in a little hyperbole. And then constant traffic, dawn to dusk, or alternately, dusk to dawn, that is absolutely not what happens at that place. I have been down there to inspect any number of times. And I've been there after dawn and before dusk, and there's times when no one's home, and I knock on the door and no one's there. And 
it's not a dawn to dust thing. Another piece of hyperbole that, that Mr. that I see is Mr. Sadler's presented a list of the registered motorcycles that have been registered, and he go, it goes to some eight or nine pages. Well, if you read that list, it's this, the same vehicles over and over again because he's recorded each time the vehicle was registered. You know, how is this the list of the number of vehicles that Mr. Chattel has owned if, if these are, um, if they're the same vehicle? And the list goes back to 1985. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not seeing the kind of activity that Mr. Sandler is describing. I simply am not. I picked out what I saw needed to be addressed I addressed it in my letter. I addressed it by having people come and inspect. Mr. Sadler made all kinds of um, statements about the hazardous materials. The, an investigator from the Department of Environmental Protection came and toured the site. And I had to um, ask her several times to make a report because she said, why am I here? So I did ask her to make, she made a formal report. I've done my due diligence. Um, I don't see a business there. Um, I didn't address whether there's, a, it's what sort of nuisance it might be. Because that wasn't what was put in front of me. I reduced what was put in front of me to the smallest piece that I could see and addressed it. Um, I, issued, I, gave, I issued orders to Mr. Chattel as a tenant and Mr. Shea as a property owner about things I wanted to have addressed, as did the electrical inspector, the fire department, the health department, and all those things have been addressed. Um, I don't feel like it's my place to tell Mr. Chattel that he can't have a hobby. It is my place to say that he can't have a business. And were, did I, if I did consider this a business, even a home business, the way he's operating it wouldn't be allowed. But I have no evidence that it's a business. And, you know, however many times Mr. Patel puts his 1985 Kawasaki Ninja out front to sell it, doesn't make that a business. That's his motorcycle. And I believe that he has a right to sell it. So he's not, to your knowledge, having people bring them his, their motorcycles, fixing them up, restoring them, and then reselling them Different different motorcycles each time at a profit. No, I, I honestly from from what I've been able to gather he doesn't do that That's not what he does And and, and I don't know how to and say the same it with cars or trucks. He's he's not I have I don't, some cars of the some of the information that um, was presented um, is prior to the original complaints But no, I don't I don't believe he's I think he has a problem hanging on to stuff. And I think that that's why the Dodge van is still there. Is he is want to let it go, but it's registered. If I understand your, your letter and your correspondence, mm -hmm. that uh, you did check with uh, neighbors, with the butters. Sort of I did. And, and Mr. Sandler provided me with the name and phone number, contact information for a person who he said could attest to the business. And I. My, I didn't contact him. One of my inspectors went and interviewed him, and he described the specific in, uh, transaction as something that absolutely, well, I mean, Mr. Chattel helped out an elderly widow. I mean, that's, um, that's an awfully nice person, but there was no, no money changed hands in that transaction, and I think it's an. So I wait, feel the like widow was the name. The widow's name was the one given to you to, to so for you to confirm that this is somebody he, he did business with, or the, the the neighbor's name was someone I was given to confirm that he'd been doing business, and that was the circumstance that he described to me. The, the and when you related to me, the the the, no, the widow wasn't the, the neighbor. No, the, the widow is actually also is a neighbor. Was Mr. Lafleur, right, who told you that according right. to your letter, yeah. sort of, and all that, and he mm -hmm. was speaking of again a neighbor, a joint neighbor, mm -hmm. who was a widow, and he was taking care right. of mm -hmm. disposing of those motor vehicles or the motorcycles for her. So, um, 
moving them beyond the home business, um, assuming that you know we, we agree with you on that basis. Um, I mean, I think any of us could be sensitive to motorcycles, you know, going in the yard, feet from the, the windows, and the amount of nuisance, especially when you don't know when it's about to happen, you know, and so it's happening periodically, sporadically, um, you can't control it, you don't know when it will happen, and, it, and you know, motorcycle noise is loud. So I guess the, the question is, you know, is there anything, and I, and I know you said that you address just the smaller issue of the home business, and I, I appreciate that because I think that's what your instructions were, that's what your direction was. But moving beyond that right now, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm hearing two different things about the level of activity, um, and obviously there's something happening <laughs> there, I don't know exactly quite how much, but you know, is there something that's not invisible, not, you know, noiseless, that does require, I mean, that's more than perhaps a court nuisance issue, but that does require some looking at with respect to the zoning ordinances around the use of the property um, that's different from than the home business. For example, we have a noise ordinance, yes. do we not? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I understand that you're saying that the allegations about the noise level were not... Um, they were exaggerated. Okay, that's that's a good word. So, um, so, but beyond that, I mean, you know, I've been next to motorcycles. I've heard them when they're on the street further away <coughs> from me, and they're regular than if they were just starting up right outside the window. So I guess that's kind of like moving on from here. Is there something new that would need to get done in terms of an investigation? Is that something that could be tackled? Um, is it something that I you think even is in your purview? Um, I, I mean, I think I haven't, uh, I've, I've actually discussed with Mr. Chattel, you know, uh, anytime I get into the middle of a dispute, I try to move both people. That's how um, I, uh, that's what I feel of my job is often is as a mediator. Um, and I often say that, that if, uh, if both people walk away a little unhappy, but um, nobody challenges it, then I've done my job well. It didn't seem possible in this situation, but, but in my conversations with Mr. Chattel, we talked, he, he offered, he told me, and I, it's secondhand, that he'd, he'd spoken to Mr. Sandler and talked about having a light on the outside of the building that Mr. Sandler could turn on when he needed quiet. And I don't know where that went, but that was one of the discussions. Mr. Uh, Chattel told me that he was worried, and this, this is again, we're a little ways off tar topic, but he was worried that Mr. Sandler would turn the light on when he got to uh, uh, work and turn it off when he left, if he remembered. But, um, but I, I don't, I, there, is, there is room in there, and that's a separate issue, which I could, would address. I would be in my role as a zoning enforcement officer addressing specifically um, section 12.1 of the zoning ordinance. We, we do have a, but a I noise ordinance. Say again? We have a noise ordinance, right? We do. And there was an issue just recently with trucks with jake brakes on South Street. Mm -hmm. Now, does this uh, noise, uh, it seems to me the level of noise that a Harley Davidson being tested in a driveway would be uh, really, would be above the level of the noise ordinance, right? I, I think it would probably be, but I am, I'm not, you know, I had a whole laundry list of things to pick from. Mm -hmm. I mean, the allegations about explosives. Um, I could have I could have contacted the, the division of alcohol, tobacco, and firearms and had them come down investigate. I picked the ones that seemed most germane to the situation. I didn't. The complaint was about a business. I didn't find a business. The complaint was, at least in the part I could see, legitimately about 
materials near the building. I addressed all those issues. I didn't go to the to the to the nuisance complaint. There certainly are. There's the zoning, and then there's also the um, the um, public nuisance statute, um, and that's clearly defined. Um, and and the police enforce it um, quite frequently. So, Karen, today. Um, is our charge just to determine whether or not it's a home business and, and then anything else subsequent to that would have to be pursued separately? Well, uh, that everything that's in the claim, so yes, basically that there's a business there, um, that there, it's not accessory, it's a standalone, so the four points I think Mr. Sandler presented. So, and you determine whether the building um, commissioner erred and would overrule. But you, I mean, you could also direct to say, clearly there's some other ancillary issues about noise and so forth, and um, ask the building commissioner to see if, um, you know, solution is in the making. Do, should we um, make a determination as to our position with respect to the home business? Well, yeah, you need to make a decision. So you that? need to respond to the complaint, the appeal that's in front of you, and say, do you agree that the appellant uh, what the appellant statements are or do um, and, and therefore overrule or overturn the building commissioners um, or not and you need a unanimous vote three members to overturn to overturn the building commission <coughs> do we I mean I, we're gonna run out of time here but I do think mr. Sandler should have the opportunity to respond to the comments that yeah. the building commissioners made. But one of those comments, Carolyn, had to do with the idea that in, in, in Mr. Hasbrook's mind, you're, you don't have a business if you're, there's no indication of any intent or history or maybe even maybe ability to make money isn't the answer, but intent to make money. And, I think we go to the Supreme Court's definition of a business, right? I mean, which Mr. Right. Sandler for provided yeah, engaged in for profit, it presumably is a, mm -hmm. relevant to the definition of a business. And you're saying from your investigations, it was the same one or two vehicles that he has been trying to sell over and over again. They're his own vehicles. They, I frankly misunderstood. I thought from the first presentation by the appellant that we had a situation here where somebody was having. Uh, acquaintances, friends, people he solicited, bring them his vehicles. He overhauled and, and restored the vehicles. Then he turned around and sold the vehicles at a profit. Um, I'm hearing a completely different picture from M Mr. Hasbrook as the result of, of his investigation, which I, I find enlightening. But I, but I do add, think that Mr. Sandler should have an opportunity. I would add that, that the other motorcycle I've seen out front was in uh, probably 2010. It was an older classic Triumph, mm -hmm. which I also know belonged to Mr. Uh, Chattel. So he's just restoring his own working, I should say working on his own two or three motorcycles. He has, and he has, and I, I mean, I don't disagree that his friends come over. That but his friends don't form. bring him other motorcycles to, to restore, fix. and then together and, they resell at a profit. Right. Your and knowledge. he does, to my knowledge, and he doesn't charge people for for the work he's doing. For the work he's doing, for the help he gives them, they just like to tinker in a very loud way, apparently, with motorcycles. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other thing, Mr. Hasbrook said, I think, while you were out, was that some of the assertions in terms of the noise levels um, would cause like instantaneous deafness. They, they, I think the building commissioner has raised the question about, he used the word hyperbole in terms of some of the allegations and uh, that was also uh, uh, well, did, did a good, I mean, I've got to say too that uh, at least from my perspective that Mr. Sandler's credibility in making these complaints is very seriously compromised by these irresponsible allegations of drug use and sort of things which were made to the to, to the police and to others. And it seems to me that he's just so desperate to get Mr. Chantel to stop this that he's going to say anything that might bring about that result. So 
Uh, I've just got to tell you that I think you damaged your case greatly by including those things. Now, is where where you were re are you still represented by Bacon and Wilson? I, I would, I would, is it, should I allow Mr. Sandler? Uh, well, except for the timing issue, do you have to go at seven thirty, Carolyn? Yeah. Well, I was gonna. I was going to wait and see <laughs> where this was at 7.30. There is a hearing that starts at 7.30 for the planning board. They might start a little bit late. Are they, they, they going to be over there or here? Um, that's to be determined. What, um, um, I was thinking that if you were done, I might bring them back over here, but it might be just as well to keep them up there. Well, the other pos obvious possibility would be a continue, to continue this. but I think there's no great reason not to. It's not nobody's economic interest is dependent upon this right there you know the, the other thing that might be directed is in the interim maybe there could be a solution uh, regarding noise you know hashed out that could, you know, help. or or to do something that judges do all the time um, if any board members were so inclined and I think you sort of you sort of started this in a way Barry is uh, if if the board as a whole is having some doubts about the uh, reliability and accuracy of some of the allegations presented by the appellant, does, does it make sense for the appellant and the building commissioner to maybe communicate further during the pendency of a continuance? Uh, to, because I mean, we could also do a straw poll of the board, which might give some guidance to the parties about um, the likelihood of success of the appellant's uh, position. But I don't know. I, I'll, I don't know what people how well, people I, feel about these. I ideas. don't know that I myself that I've made a decision until I've heard more. Okay, so so you you say it's premature to do that. Okay, I think so. And I do think, in all fairness, that Mr. Sandler should have an opportunity to respond to the sure. statements that have been made by Mr. Hasbro. Can I do that now while it's fresh in your mind? Uh, if you want to briefly take a few minutes now and then we'll see where we are. Does that make sense? Um, sure. Uh, and, and certainly just to address the issue of, re of repair over there, uh, the motorcycles that are coming over are, are being worked on. So people are bringing their bikes over for repair. That's what's being worked on when third parties, like the picture of the motorcycle in the back of the red pickup truck, it's a bike being brought over for repair. But do you know that he's charging anyone I have no for idea. his time? Uh, no, I, I know he tells the building inspector that he doesn't. Okay. Um, okay. In the case of the widow, uh, you'd have to do more investigation. What I heard in that case is that, that in fact, he was going to charge. The good neighborly thing would have been, yeah, I can fix these for you. My understanding was there was compensation involved there and it was for profit but again that was second hand as far as the noise goes we've uh, I've repeatedly asked uh, the the building department to measure the noise over there to my knowledge that hasn't happened but if I may I pass these out sure okay, this is um, so this is um, a copy of uh, and you asked the question earlier too about at recent activity this is a police report from uh, um, the 29th of August where, in fact, this, to my knowledge, this is the first time the city has actually measured um, noise. Um, as far as um, what the, um, the noise level, you know, what the max noise level is uh, that's, that's going on. Um, uh, let me also add, and also be this would be some other So 91, it was, the police found 91 so decibels. They found 91 decibels at, this, and again, to my knowledge, this is the only time this has ever been measured. Now, keep in mind, this is, this is the end of, this was done on, in, at the end of August, so we're talking about roughly four months after the initial complaint. Uh, that's 91 decibels at 30 feet. My property line is five feet from where the motorcycle was sitting at the time it was measured. Uh, and, and when I had called about this inside my building, I had measured it at 84 decibels. This is just one example, and again, this goes on repeatedly. Uh, the other thing is, when you have five motorcycles coming out through that right away all together, the decibel meter spikes significantly. And I guess we'd have to, to get some expert to be able to measure that to everyone's satisfaction. The other question that I asked earlier, and again, I really don't understand um, why we don't know this now, but what I've given you there uh, is, 
is a copy of, of the RMB you know, regulations in terms of what can or can't be found out. You know, we're, we're asking about what's going on there. At the time the complaint was made, there were 12 motorcycles housed in those garages and another motorcycle that you've got a copy of behind it that was in shambles under a blue tarp. There were, so there were 12 or more motorcycles on the property. After the inspection, some of those were gone. But to this day, we have no idea whose motorcycles there were. Why were there so many motorcycles there? Why don't we know whose motorcycles there were? But the only issue for us is, is it a business? And well, if, it, and which, which is, so I, I, I do I, think this point about was he, is, was he doing it, was he taking money or not? If you're not taking money from people to work on motorcycles, but that isn't our complaint. If, if but, you, but that's the issue before us. No, no. The issue before us isn't the noise. I, no, I understand, but the complaint is that he is, he is buying vehicles, pickup trucks, boat engines, cars, motorcycles. He buys them, he fixes them, he sells them. That's but, the business. But you understand, we have the building inspector telling us based on his investigation that is not the case no evidence of that. but we've presented you with all kinds of evidence in the appeal we've got multiple cases in the appeal that, that show you pictures of vehicle after vehicle you know at least you know what you just said boat engine I didn't sorry? see any pictures of a boat engine. there is no picture of a boat engine in there because we weren't able to document that but there are multiple pictures of motorcycles um, and other vehicles that but suppose for example that he has a lot of friends and he has tools and these friends come over and he allows them to use his tools he may even give them a little bit of advice on how to fix a motorcycle and stuff like that but he doesn't take any money for that is that a commercial activity or not i should say it isn't well we don't know the answer to whether he does or he doesn't he says he doesn't we don't know what's you going on have, you can't give us any evidence that he does right the evidence that i've presented to you is the evidence of what we can prove which is that motorcycles trucks and other vehicles are coming into the property and then being resold on craigslist on on um, multiple different uh forums online and in the yard i mean there's been you know, he, he fixed up a, a Jeep Wrangler a few years ago. Same thing, sold it out front. He fixed up a boat a few years ago, sold it out front. I mean, basically, the, the, the question is, that I, I, to your point, I don't know the answer. To, I think it would take a lot more investigation and some forensic accounting probably to answer your question. I don't know the answer to that part of it. All I know is that that just creates a disturbance. The business part of this, which I do know, which we've documented in the appeal, is that there's plenty of evidence of commercial activity. I buy, I buy a vehicle that's not operable. In the one case, I showed you a pickup truck hauled onto the property. I fix it up, and then I sell it for a profit. You know, it would be really nice to hear from Mr. Chappelle. Oh, my. From Mr. Chappelle, if he'd be okay. willing to is he, is he Maybe that one, I, I don't know. I mean, that because could be another Because we're, we're hearing day yeah, and night. Yeah, really. And, I mean, the one and, thing that you said before that I hard. appreciate is that, you know, you're not aware of any advertising that he does. You're not aware of any signs. Um, I'm not seeing any evidence. I've seen everything you've presented, but there's nothing in there that indicates he's holding himself out as a business. Um, so I'm just, I, I don't know how these, the plethora of motorcycles that you're describing in this long line that come onto his property, where they would come from. You know, how, how people would learn of his doing this, which leads me to think that, you know, these really are people that know him, as, as the building commissioner has described here. And so I think, you know, at this point where we need to adjourn, it might make some sense, you know, to, to think about that. Um, and, I, and I do think it makes sense for, you know, if the building commissioner is willing at this point to go back out with an eye towards some of these other ordinances that may be affected by the situation and, and see what might be able to be done. But Except it sounds like he's already been there many times, but I hear what you're saying. I, I think, with well, a different well, also I think you, you know, your, your point right, is, is a good point in terms of, um, you know, what, what's going on um, on the property um, with those with those multiple vehicles, but we've again we've demonstrated 
I think that the issue isn't, you know, the friends coming over. The issue is what we've been able to clearly document, which it seems to me that the, the question is, what's the standard for a business operation? And, you know, depending upon how you define that, and again, I think we've kind of all agreed that the, the Supreme Court definition is a reasonable standard for that. So then the question is, you know, if you buy a vehicle for $100 and you fix it up and you sell it for $2,500, you've made a profit. So your activity is a business activity. You've taken something. But, 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 but it's, if, if, well, it has to be consistent, it has to be regular, and it has to be for a profit. And that, I don't think you've clearly established that. So I think, I think we're, we're, we've come full circle. I appreciate your um, situation and what you've tried to describe to us. And, um, yeah, the, the next, the next, yeah, the next, well, the there. next hearing date is November 13th. And you already have one continuation for 530, which was the sign down at um, on Pleasant oh, right. Street. So you could do this to uh, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock on November 13th? Yeah. I make a motion to continue the meeting to 6 o'clock on November 13th. In this, Second? And in this room? In this room. That's unanimous. I have moved to the adjourn. Can I go back before we? Yes. Um, oh, do we have that, a is, I can't imagine this will be resolved in a half an hour, especially if Mr. Chateau is willing to come. We have an hour. Oh, I thought you said it has to be done by 6. No, this no, we is start at six. Six. We'll, we'll start at 6 because at 5.30 we have another. <coughs> We've got that, uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about starting. Yeah. No, so we have from 6 to 7. Well, that means there's enough time on that. Other well, why, don't, why don't we schedule it at quarter of just in the case so that it could, might not take uh, the okay. whole. 545? So 545, okay. yeah. That's for this year, for the continuance, 545? Yeah, 545, yeah. November's 13th in this room. Okay. Can I make a request? Sure. Um, in the interim, since it's allowable, um, could the board or the building inspector get the the information on all the vehicles that were there at the time of the complaint from the r and I think that's your responsibility. I can't by law. It's got to be a board or a it's got to be some, it's got to be a public official. agency. I'm not allowed to, to get that, that information, but you are allowed to get that information as is the building inspector, and I think it might be helpful. But to begin with, I think that what it was at the time, that is back in April, is not germane. What we'd like to know is what's going on now. In fact, how would you even do it back for a dated back to April. I, I'm just I'm figuring there was a complaint, there was an inspection, and there must be documentation of the vehicles that were there. I mean, that was the whole crux of the complaint, is that there's, you know, well, all we these certainly don't have any investigative no, uh, capabilities. Uh, it's just simply a request to the RMB. That, that's, you know, a, that's assuming, and I guess the question is for the building inspector, whether or not he documented all the vehicles on the property at the time of the complaint. Well, we can ask him that, or Carolyn can ask that question uh, between now and November 13th. It might be helpful. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't think he'd be under any obligation to do it, so long as unregistered things are removed. Right. So. Okay. Okay, so uh, motion to adjourn. Uh, I second. All, all in favor, that's yep. unanimous. Thank you. Thank you.